The night is nearly over. The day is almost here. So let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. And do this, knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. His introductions become more difficult to live up to. <laughs> you don't help me, you know that. Terrific. We're going to do something different tonight. We're going to be looking at material that will be so, uh, quite damaging to Islam, and that's the whole intention. I make no apologies for that. I've spent 30 years confronting Islam, 20 years in London, doing it weekly at a place called Speaker's Corner. And one of the things that comes up over and over again is the problem concerning Muhammad and the Quran. Those are really the two pillars of Islam. Islam falls if the Quran is not true. Islam falls if Muhammad is not a prophet. Now, as I said this morning, we fall if the Bible is not true. Christianity falls if Jesus is not God. So on the same token, we're going to be asking these questions concerning Islam. What exactly or who exactly is Muhammad and what is the Quran? Where did it come from? So let's go ahead. Now, just to, so you know, everything that I put up on the screen is on PowerPoint. I'll be following the PowerPoint. That will be available on the church website. So you can pull it down. Any of you can have access to this website. Don't feel you have to write or keep up with me. I go too fast. But let's go ahead and let's see what the Muslims claim. What they claim is, first of all, that Muhammad is the last and the greatest prophet. They would say that all the other prophets that came before, every one of them had problems. Therefore, God finally gave his final revelation to Muhammad. He is the greatest, the seal of all prophets. They would say that the Quran was his revelation, sent down only to him, and is the final and greatest revelation. So every other book that has gone ahead has been corrupted. And so when you look at these two books, they would say this book Though we call it a revelation, has been corrupted, this comes and seals it. It is the final revelation. If there's any contradiction between these two books, this one always is the one that abrogates the other. And that's found in two references in the Quran, in Surah I Ayah 106 and Surah 16, Ayah 101. That which we give, mansuk, we give something better, nasik. Nasik abrogates the mansuk. So if there is any contradiction, this is mansuk, this is nasik. This is what destroys, according to Islam, anything that disagrees with the Qur'an. Therefore, Islam is the final religion based on Muhammad's life and sayings, which is known as the Sunnah. Everything he did, everything he said is the Sunnah. He is the example for all peoples, in all places, in all times. And the Qur'an, his teachings. Now, conclusion, Islam is therefore completely dependent on both Muhammad and the Quran. So let's go ahead and investigate both Muhammad and the Quran and see if indeed the Muslims are correct. This is what Muslims have told us. And this is, you, what I'm gonna do now is just look at the classical account. What do Muslims say concerning Muhammad? First and foremost, they say that he was born in 570. That he then got a revelation from a angel in Jibril while he was in the Hira cave, just north of Mecca. Jibril comes to him while he's meditating and says, Akra, recite. And his response was, Ma'akra, I cannot recite. He was squeezed, and then the angel repeats the same order. That happened three times. Finally, the angel lets him go. He goes back to Mecca, tells the story to his wife, Khadija. She then gives a test to him, and she, he passed that test. And then she goes and tells Waraka ibn Nufal, her cousin, what had happened. And Waraka ibn Nufal, then, the cousin of Khadija, who was a Christian, 
stipulates that truly he is a prophet. So it's one of the ironies of history that the person that actually gave the pronouncement as Muhammad is a prophet was a Christian. This is according to their account. In 610 then, those revelations started coming. And if you look at the Quran and you just basically put it in half. Now this one, this Quran, uh, because it's in Arabic, it starts from the right and goes to the left. So for the, the, if you just split it in half, the first part of the Quran, or what we know as Medina, the second would be Mecca, the name of the two cities where he lived. So this would be Mecca, though it's the last, latter half of the Quran. This would be Medina, though it's the first half. Confusing, isn't it? Just turn it upside down and you get the right sequence. But that it basically says that this part, the latter part, was revealed between 610 and 622, the first 12 years. In 621, <clears throat> he was woken up in the middle of the night, told to get on the back of the winged horse called Burak there in Mecca, and he flies up to Jerusalem, where in Jerusalem, on the rock, where the Dome of the Rock is built, he then ascends the seven heavens, meets Allah. Allah tells him to pray 50 times a day. He says, okay, he comes down two heavens to the fifth heaven, he meets Moses. Moses says, how many times did he tell you to pray? And he was said, well, I was told to pray 50 times. He says, no, go back up and see if you can get it down. So he goes back up to the seventh heaven, gets it to 45, comes back to Moses, no, still too many. So he goes back and forth, bouncing between Allah and Moses, and brings it down from 45 to 40 to 35 to 30, down to 15, down to 10, finally to five prayers. Once he gets it to five prayers, then Moses, okay, that's enough. So it's Moses that actually stipulates how many prayers Muslims are to pray a day. Comes back down then to Jerusalem, gets back on the burak, the wing horse, and flies back to Mecca. That's called the Miraj. That happens in 621. In 622 then, he then moves from Mecca up to Medina. That's called the Hijrah, the Exodus, with about 80, some say as many as 200 followers. And that is because of the problems he's having in Mecca. And then from 622 to 632, the last 10 years of his life, he receives the Medinan material, which is all the first part of the Quran this material here. Now, there are some Meccan references in Medinan, and there's also some Medinan in the Meccan, but rule of thumb, that's Meccan, that's Medinan. Then from 6.30, at 6.30, he then goes into Mecca, and he takes over Mecca. He then controls all that central part of Arabia called the Hijaz, and he dies in 6.32. Suddenly, some believe he was poisoned. From 632 to 634, Abu Bakr then takes over, rules for two years. He dies peacefully. From 634 to 644, Umar then takes over, and he is one of the ones that moves out and starts confronting and uh, basically conquering many of the great cities of the Levant. He conquers Basra, he conquers Baghdad, he conquers Damascus, he conquers Jerusalem, and he conquers Cairo. So the five great cities of the Levant are now under Arab control. You notice I'm saying Arab control. Not Muslim, you'll see why. That happens under the time of Uthman, Umar. So by 642, the five great cities of Levant are now under Arab control. 644 to 656, Uthman then takes over. And Uthman, the third caliph, is important because it is he that actually compiles the Quran. It is he that's given that responsibility. He realizes that there were a number of different variations on the Quran. So he tells Zaidi bin Thabit, who is the secretary of Muhammad, to then rewrite the Quran and to correct it if it needs be, if there's any difficulty, then to use the Qureshi dialect. And he's given uh, three other men to help him, Zubair, Alas, and Harith, and the four of them rewrite the Quran and create what we know as the canon of the Quran. That's when the Quran was finally written down, 650, 18 years after Muhammad. The Quran had not been written down when Muhammad died. It was finally written down at the time of Uthman. Very important, 650. Keep that date in your head. 650, mid seventh century. He is then killed and then Ali comes to power and rules only for five years. Ali is the adopted son of Muhammad. Really, for as far as the Shiites are concerned, the really only legitimate heir to Muhammad. Now that's known that period from five, I'm sorry, from 622 or 624 up until 661, that roughly 40-year period is known as the Rashidun period. That is the rightly guided caliph period. That is the beginning of Islam. That's the golden period of Islam. That's the classical account. Now, I'm just giving you bare bones, just a skeletal, skeleton view. I'm, there could be many other things I could have added to the story, but that's what Muslims have been telling us for 1,400 years. Ooh, wait a minute. Not 1,400 years. I correct myself. 1,200 years. Why do I say that? Has anybody heard any other account? That's really what you've been taught, is it not? That's what you're taught in your schools. 
That's what all the Muslims are taught. And in every school around the world, this is the classical account. And there's been no reason not to doubt it because there's no reason for us to assume that anything else has happened or it could be any different. However, take a look and see where is it we get that account from. Most of you probably don't know that everything we know about Muhammad himself, his life, is written down in what we call the Siratul Rasulullah, the biography, the life of the Prophet of God. The first man to write it down is Ibn Isak. And you can see up there on the... Let me just get this thing working. I hope I can get it working so I don't blind myself. Here we go. That's Ibn Isak right there. Look at his date. 765. 765. The first biography we have of the Prophet is not written down until 765. He dies in 632. Can you see a problem? The first sayings we have for the Prophet, the sayings are the Hadith. These are enormous amount of material. 600,000 Hadith were given to a man named Al-Buhari. Al-Buhari dies right here. I'm sorry, let me get this right. See his, I'm sorry, Al-Buhari right here. 870. The first Hadith are written down by him. Oh, let me back up. Hold on a minute. Did I say Ibn Isak is the first one to write down his biography? That's true, but we don't have any of Ibn Isak's material. We're dependent on this man right here, Ibn Hisham, 833. He was a student of uh, Ibn Isak. He then takes what Ibn Isak has given him, and he throws out what he doesn't like and only retains what he likes. So the only thing we know about Muhammad comes from Ibn Hisham. His date is 833. Muhammad died in 632. Can you see the problem? The first sayings, these 600,000 akbars that are given to al-Buhari, he is then to whittle away that which he doesn't like. He takes it from 600,000 and retains only 7,397. So he throws out 98% of it, only retains 2% of it, and that 2% are the nine volumes we have of al-Buhari. You can go up online and read them. But that is done in 870. That's 240 years later. Then if you want to talk about the tafsir, to understand this book, you need commentaries. And the commentaries are first written down by Al-Tabari. And Al-Tabari is right there, 923. The first tafsir we have written by Al-Tabari. Now, many other tafsirs that come after that, you had Baidawi, Zamakshari, Suyuti, and many others. But the first one is Al-Tabari, 923, 10th century. So, put this in perspective. Everything we know about Muhammad, all his life, everything that happened, how Islam began over here, doesn't get written down till over here, two to three hundred years later. Does that bother any of you? Yeah. That should bother all of you. Two hundred years of what? Why did it take two hundred years to write down his story? Why did it take over two hundred years, two hundred and forty years to write down his sayings? And where did they get it from? Who are these people? Did they ever know Muhammad? Not one of them knew Muhammad. Al-Buhari from Buharistan. Buharistan is in present-day Iraq. Al-Tabari from Tabaristan. That's in present-day Iran. These were people that lived hundreds of miles away and hundreds of years later. So what were they dependent on? Well, they were dependent on what we know as oral tradition. Now, let's look at Jesus. Jesus, we know, has a biography written. In fact, not just one biography. We know of four biographies written about Jesus' life, Right? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We know that three of them were written within 40 to 50 years of his life. We know that one John wrote much later, about 60 years. But we know that John was an eyewitness to everything he wrote, was he not? Matthew was an also an eyewitness to everything he wrote. And Mark and Luke got it from the eyewitnesses. So you have four testimonies, four biographies of Jesus Christ, written either by those who were with Jesus or those who got it from those with Jesus. We know that all the New Testament was written by the first century. Can you see the difference? We're dependent on 30 to 40 years of oral, oral tradition based on the very eyewitness example of the people that actually wrote it. Islam is dependent on two to 300 years of oral tradition. Can you see the problem? As a comparison, if we, were to, if we were to impose on the person of Jesus Christ what Islam is now finding out about their prophet, we would have nothing about Jesus written from within Christian sources until the third century. Can you imagine us getting up here? Can you imagine Jack being able to speak and talk about Jesus authoritatively if everything he was dependent on only began to appear in the third century? 
we would know who Jesus was. And why would we trust it? Yet this is something Muslims have not acknowledged. So the Western world, especially the secular scholars, are now asking two things. And they're coming up to two suppositions. Islam, as we know what they say, did not exist in the 7th century, but evolved over a period of two to 300 years. And the Quran probably was not revealed to one man in 22 years, but likely evolved over a period of 50 to 100 years. Their conclusion? The history of Islam, at least from the time of the Caliph Abdul Malik, he ruled from 685 to 705, and before is a later fabrication. Now that's a huge amount to say. But we're going to prove that now tonight. We're going to show you why that's so damaging and what we're now finding. Their concern is this. If so much of the history of early Islam was written down so late, then why did it take so long to write it all down? Were these people not literate? Yes, they were. Remember, by 642, they had taken over Basra, Baghdad, Damascus, Jerusalem, and Cairo. Could people not read and write in Damascus, Jerusalem, Cairo, Basra, Baghdad? Were these not great metropolises? Did they not have a library in Alexandria that was destroyed by fire in the 5th century? Certainly these people could read and write. But more than that, they started moving right across North Africa, by 661, they had taken much of North Africa. They started moving the other direction towards India. And by the end of the 7th century, by the time that Abdul Malik comes to power, they controlled all the way from Spain in the west to India in the east. Are you suggesting no one could read and write in any of those countries? And the Muslims themselves tell us that they can read and write. Because where in the world did this book come from? It's a book. It has... Words, letters, written down. According to Islamic tradition, it was written down by Zaid ibn Thabit. Who was Zaid ibn Thabit? He was a secretary of Muhammad. How can you be a secretary if you can't read and write? They themselves tell us that this book was written down in 650, under the time of Uthman. So you can't make up that excuse, though Muslims are trying to make up that excuse now. You can't make up that excuse. And where did the biographers get their material from? If it was based on oral tradition, do we trust oral tradition? If I tell you something in your ear and you tell your wife and she tells another woman, by the time it gets to him, what I tell you and what he tells me are two different things. You ever played that game? It's a great game to play. We do it all the time in birthday parties. Chinese whispers. Sorry, Chinese. Or telephone. And this is a game that shows exactly the problem with oral tradition, especially oral tradition if it's based on someone that's important to your identity as Muhammad would be. It gets embellished all the way. Therefore, they're asking, can it be trusted? Should we not instead go to the period these events took place? Should we not go back to the 7th century and see what we find? So, what are they finding? Well, let's take a look at that map real quickly. You can see right here, by the time 661, Islam had, uh, sorry, did I say Islam? Ooh, forgive me. The Arabs had already moved out from this part of the world over into this part of the world, all the way up into here. All that land was under their jurisdiction. I'm losing my... Do we have another one of these? I just think I ruined this one. <laughs> Here we go, there we go back again. This area all the way to that area was under their jurisdiction. So we're not talking about a people that were destitute. We're not talking about a people that were persecuted. We're not talking about people that were oppressed like Christianity was to begin with. Remember, Christianity for the first 300 years were underground. They were persecuted. Our scriptures were destroyed. The, the Diocletian Edict in 300 destroyed many of our manuscripts. Islam can't make that excuse. They controlled this whole swath of land. They controlled these cities. There's no way in the world that any of these Qurans should have been destroyed or lost or burnt. So there's a whole new school now that's asking some disturbing questions. Men like Dr. John Wansborough, head of the department at School of Oriental and African Studies, who wrote two books in the 1970s, Quranic Studies and Sectarian Milieu. These two books that were written in the 1970s blew open this whole notion that Islam began with a man named Muhammad. Dr. Hotting, who I studied there at the School of Oriental and uh, School of Oriental African Studies in the 1990s, who has taken much of John Wandsworth's material and has put it down to layman's terminology so we can understand it. Dr. Patricia Corona, who was my supervisor when I began my doctorate there in Cambridge University, Dr. Patricia Corona from Denmark. She can read and write 15 languages, 
all archaic languages. How many of you can read and write 15 languages? <laughs> Dr. Andrew Rippon from Calgary University in Canada has probably one of the best books written on how to understand this historical material that you can read. Dr. Robert Hoyland, Dr. Hoyland, who is out of Oxford University. He was my second supervisor when I began. He reads and writes 18 languages. These are linguists. These are people that are going back to the original documents. And that's why they're so dangerous. Dr. Yehuda Nebo, out of the University of Jerusalem, who's probably done the best work on looking at the oldest Islamic, or what we know as Arabic inscriptions. And he's probably done a devastating work, we'll talk about a little bit more later, concerning what we now know about Muhammad. And then from the German school, Dr. Luning, Dr. Prynne, Dr. von Bothmer, Dr. Oleg, from Saderland University in Saarbrücken, have probably done the best work on the Islamic or the Quranic manuscripts, and we're going to introduce some of their material tonight. But there have been two books and one documentary which are paving the way. And these are books you can read. The first one was written by Dr. Tom Holland. Dr. Tom Holland was a friend, still is. He and I went and had dinner back in 2006. I had just done a documentary with him on St. Paul. I told him at dinner afterwards that I'm not really an expert on St. Paul, but that he, is, as a historian, needs to change gears. Now, this man has written three bestsellers in Britain. He's kind of considered to, to be one of our most celebrated historians in Britain today. He wrote Rubicon, which is the fall of the Roman Empire. He wrote Millennium, the fall of the Byzantine Empire. And he wrote Persian Fire, the fall of the Persian Empire. So I turned to him and I said, hold it, stop and think, Tom. These empires fell in the seventh century. What came next? And he said, well, Islam, of course. I said, exactly. You're the best equipped to write the next chapter. He said, well, what should I do? What is you're talking about? I said, well, just write this down. So I gave 10 historical challenges in 2006. He wrote them down quickly, and that's the last I heard of Dr. Tom Holland until last year, 2012. Someone phoned me and said, have you looked at the Sunday Times? They're on the cover of the Sunday Times was that book up there on the right, by, written by Dr. Tom Holland, In the Shadow of the Sword, was featured on the Sunday Times. He was going to have a meeting to introduce that book at Oxford University. So I went to that meeting. As soon as I walked in, he came up to me, grabbed my hand. He says, because of you, I wrote this book. He took six years to write this book. He went back to Dr. Patricia Corona. He went back to Dr. Hotting. He went back to all the best scholars in the world. He took their material, and then he wrote it so you can understand it. He has done you all a favor. You need to get that book. Now, it's 400 pages long. Don't read it in one night. Right now, as of last month, the hardback, which you see here in Britain, that's the hardback, is number one on the bestsellers list for all Islamic books. His paperback, which is the red one right there, is number two in the bestsellers list in the Islamic section. Guess what's number three? The Quran. Both the hardback and the paperback are outselling the Quran. Now your edition is this one right here. Yours is in white. I don't know why they've changed it. It's the same content in between. It's just a different cover. Go and get that book and read it, because it will explain much of what I'm going to talk about tonight. Then last year in August, a year ago, August 28th, he showed a documentary on Channel 4 television, which is one of our major channels there in Britain. It's only 90 minutes long, and he took what he had written in the, in the Shadow of the Sword, called it Islam, the Untold Story, but he bent over backwards not to come to any conclusions, and he even had a Muslim scholar on the show with him to react to what he was saying. That show caused so much furore, caught so much anger amongst the Muslims that when they tried to show it a second time in November of last year, Channel 4 television got so many complaints from the Muslims that they did not show it a second time. Now, you are not permitted to see that show. No one outside of the UK can see that show. They don't want the rest of the world to see it. That's how damaging it is. Doesn't matter, I have it right here on my computer. <laughs> So we're going to give it to the church, and any of you that want to see it, please look at it. It's only nine minutes long, and you will see why this is so damaging to Islam. 
Now, another man is Dr. Dan Gibson. Dr. Dan Gibson is an archaeologist. His father was an archaeologist. His grandfather was an archaeologist. He grew up in an archaeological environment. And he decided to move to the Middle East. And for the last 20 years, he has been living amongst the Bedouin, moving around the Middle East and looking at all the geographic places that are mentioned in the Quran. When you look at the Quran, you will see there are many geographical locations. And he came out last year with this book, Quranic Geography. Now, you can buy the book if you want to, but just go up online and order the PDF. It only costs $15. Get it, look at it, and see what it says. Because this book is going to do damage, enormous damage, to the emergence of Islam. And you'll see why. I'm going to share some of that material tonight. But let's go through and find out what these Orientalists, what these revisionists are finding. Take a look and see up there on the screen what they're finding. First of all, what they find, now find is that the first Arab inscription referring, referencing Muhammad is not till 691. We hear nothing about Muhammad from any Muslim sources until 691. Muhammad died in 632. It takes 60 years before any Muslim or any Arab refers to his name. That's curious. Secondly, the first reference to the people called Muslims is not till the 690s. There's no reference at all to anybody called Muslims until 690. Now remember, who is ruling the Arab world in 690? Abd al-Malik. Abd al-Malik came to power in 685, and from 685 to 705, he was the ruler. It is he that introduces Muhammad's name. It is he that introduces the name Muslim. What is the name that these people who were conquering all these cities called themselves? They call themselves Saracens. They call themselves Maghrites. They call themselves Ishmaelites. They call themselves Hagarines. They call themselves Muhajirins. What does that mean? A Saracen really is a name for an Arab. The Ishmaelites and the Hagarines, that's, of course, their inheritance. They look, to the, they look back to Abraham through Ishmael to Hagar. The Maghrites, that's the place that they come from. And the Muhajirus are those who are in Exodus, those who are basically roaming, going from one place to another, nomadic. The Muhajirs, the ones who do have an Exodus. Those are the names they call themselves, and in all the documentation we can find from the 7th century, these are the names they call themselves. Not once do we find any reference to people called Muslims until the 690s. That's troubling. There's no reference to any religion called Islam until 691. It is first introduced on the Dome of the Rock in Jerusalem, where Amir is from. It is there on the Dome of the Rock, on the inner ambulatories, that we find the first reference to Muhammad as a prophet. It is introduced by Abdul al-Malik in 691, and then introduced on coins in 692. So we have no reference to Muhammad as a prophet, or any reference to the Muslims, or any reference to a religion called Islam until 691, 60 years after Muhammad. Now here's the part, hardest part. The first reference to Mecca is not till 741. Ooh. Muhammad died in 632. We're going to come back to that. That's so significant. We have to come back to that. And the first biography of Muhammad, as I said earlier, is not till 833. Now, Dan Gibson wanted to look, and he noticed that when you look at the Quran, you will notice reference after reference, about 65 references to geographical locations in the Quran. And what was interesting, nine places are named, and the three that are named most most often are the place called Ad, the people of Ad, 23 times, the people of Tamud, 24 times, and the people of Midian, seven times. But these people in Ad and these people in Midian, these people of Tamud are not anywhere near Mecca. Mecca is down here. These people all live up here, 600 miles further north. So if these people are being referred to all the time in the Quran, why is it they're not close to Mecca? Where so they should be. They're much too far north. We've got a problem with Mecca. There's only one reference in the entire Quran to Mecca. I don't know if you know that. But there are many places in the Quran where it says the settlement where the prophet came from. Even Muhammad's name is not referred there. Only four times will you find Muhammad's name in the Quran. Always you'll find the messenger or the prophet or the place of the prophet or the settlement of the prophet. But it doesn't say which prophet. Muslims haven't put the name Mus Muhammad in there in parentheses. They've included it in there. They've imposed it in there. But that's not what it says in Arabic. Did you know that? So we know there's a prophet, we know he comes from the settlement, but who is this prophet and from what settlement? That's what we're trying to ask. When you look at Mecca, 
you will see it also has many problems. According to the Quran and according to the traditions, it mentions this settlement where the Prophet comes from is in a valley, has a parallel valley, has a stream going through it with a, parallel, with a pillar of salt right outside of it from which the Prophet would go past in the morning and come back in the evening. The pillar of salt, of course, is the wife of Lot. With fields, trees, grass, clay, loam, olive trees are there in this settlement. And that mountains are overlooking the Kaaba. It refers to the Kaaba. But take a look at Mecca. Mecca has no valley. It's a plain. It has no stream and only has one well, the Zamzam well. There is no pillar of salt anywhere near it. That's 600 miles further north. There are no fields. There is no trees, grass, clay, loam. There are no olive trees. There are no olive trees in all of Arabia. The only olive trees you'll find are around the Mediterranean, 600 miles further north. Mountains overlooking the Kaaba, the closest mountains are five kilometers away. There's a problem. Mecca is not in this valley. It has none of these listed above because it is too arid and too dry. Why hadn't anybody noticed this before? The Kaaba that is mentioned, we are told that it resides in the mother of all settlements, but doesn't say where that settlement is. Tradition tells us it is where Adam and Eve were cast down to in Surah 7, Ayah 24. And Muslim tradition tells us that that reference is referring to Mecca, but it doesn't say so in the Quran. That comes to the traditions that are written in the 9th and 10th century that say it's Mecca. And if that is the case, that means Mecca is the oldest city in history if Adam and Eve were sent there. According to the traditions, it's in Mecca that Abraham, I had no idea Abraham lived in Mecca, but that's what the traditions tell us, <laughs> that Abraham lived in Mecca and that he rebuilt the Kaaba along with his son Ishmael. It's traditions that tell us that Mecca is the center of trade, north, south, east, and west. And that's where the trade route theory comes up. We know about the trade route theory because some of the Westerners actually were the ones that constructed it. But take a look at the trade routes in the 7th century. This is a map from the 7th century looking at all the trade. And take a look. That question mark is where Mecca is. Mecca is not on any trade route map. Mecca is not listed anywhere in any map. There's no reference to Mecca in any documentation from the 7th century. Take a look and see what is listed. Petra. Petra is the center of the trade, right, right up there. Mecca should be right there. There's a big question mark there where Mecca is today, but not on any trade route. And take a look at the trade route. This map here, Dr. Patricia Corona looked at, and I hope this, um, I'm having a little bit problem with my pointer, but see if this works. All the trade was coming from India and China over in here. And of course, they could have gone this direction to get over to the Mediterranean world, but you have mountains. They have the Himalayas and the Hindu Kush. So they had to take the trade across the Arabian Sea here from the western coast of India. And usually they went up through the Persian Gulf and then over into the uh, Mediterranean world. But then there were big wars between the Sassanids, who were the Persians, and the Byzantines, who were the Christians. And they were warring at each other for about 200 years in the 5th, 6th, up to the 12th, 7th century, which meant that all the trade had to be redirected down through the Arabian Gulf, uh, Arabian Sea, over to Aden, down here in the south, taken off board ship, and they went across on this line, going right up to Nazran, Sana, up to Taif. Then according to Islam, down to Mecca, up to Yathrib, which is the archaic name for Medina, and up to Tabuk, Khaybar, and on up to Gaza in the north. That's the trade route theory. Have you all heard this theory before? Every Muslim tells me about this theory, and every Orientalist has said that's the trade route theory. That's what made Mecca rich. My 10-year-old son saw a problem with that theory. See if any of you can see a problem. Don't look at me, look at the map. <laughs> Do you see a problem? Does anybody see a problem with that theory? Mr. Navy man, you should know it right away. There you go, the Navy man gets it. There's a sea going right up the west coast. Why didn't they keep it on board ship? That's 1,250 miles by sea. Remember, Dr. Patricia Crone found that you can go 50 miles by land for the same price as 1,250 miles by sea. It's much cheaper to go by sea. That's why we even do it today. All the cars that you're driving out here that are Toyota, that are, or the, all the other products that are coming from China do not come overland, they all come by sea. Because it's prohibitively expensive to take it overland. You've got to protect it. You've got to maintain the camels. You've got to feed them. You've got to also make sure that no one, that no duckoids come and destroy your goods. Therefore, why in the world would they take all their, some, their goods off board there at Aden? Patricia Corona asked this question in the 1980s, and she wrote a book in 1987 called Meccan Trade and the Rise of Islam. She wrote it while she was head of department at, Cambridge, at, at Oxford University. That book, read it, 
Basically, she asked a very good historical question. If there was trade going across there, why is it no one took a look at this map? Because right there in Taif, the trade route comes down off the plateau. All of these places, Najran, Tabuk, Khaybar, Taif, Yathrib, they're all on the western plateau. Mecca is not on the western plateau. It's off the western plateau a thousand feet. From Taif, you have to go down a thousand feet to get Mecca and then come back up a thousand feet to get to Yathrib. Why had no one noticed that before? She said, this doesn't make any sense. So therefore, reading and writing 15 languages, she went back to all the original documents. She went back to all the trading documents from the 2nd, 3rd, 4th, 5th, 6th century. She went back to all the historical documents. She went back to Cosmos, the Theodoretus, to Herodotus. He went back to all these historians who were writing in around this part of the world. And she noticed that they all refer to trade going all the way to India, but the trade was all coming from here in Africa. It was the Eritreans, it was the Agilus, the name that comes up over and over again is Agilus, the capital of Eritrea at that time. They were in charge of the trade. Why? Because they love boats. Arabs don't like boats. They like camels. They are nomadic. They're not boat people. No wonder there was no names, no Arab names whatsoever here on the west coast of India. All the names were African. It was the African uh, sea trade that controlled all the trade. So therefore, she asked, well, then what do we know about Mecca? Therefore, what was the importance of Mecca? She scoured all the books. She couldn't find any reference to any place called Mecca until 741. 741. Muhammad died in 632. That's over 100 years before the first reference she could find of Mecca, and that was found in the Apocalypse of Pseudomethodius, Continuato Byzantia Arabica. That's a big title. I'm glad I don't have to say that too often. 741. And the first map that showed Mecca on it was not till 900. No map before 900 had Mecca on it. If you don't have Mecca, what are you going to do with the Qibla? Now, the Qibla is a direction of prayer that every Muslim must pray. They must pray towards Mecca. They must pray towards that building right up there. They must pray to the Kaaba, which is right there. There is the sanctuary today. That's what it looks like today. Here are the thousands, millions of people who go to Mecca to do the Hajj every year. Two million every year. Every Muslim knows that they are to pray towards Mecca. Why? Because it is written in the scriptures, in the Quran, in Surah 2, Ayah 145 to 190, I'm sorry, 145 to 149, that the direction of the Qibla was changed to Mecca in 624. So 624, every mosque must be facing Mecca. More than that, if you're praying anywhere around the world, you will notice that when you go to a mosque, you have a mihrab, this little structure here that shows where the direction of prayer is. Uh, when I was in Kuala Lumpur, in my hotel room, there was the Qibla right there on the wall showing me what direction to pray while I was there in Kuala Lumpur. Uh, today they use these kind of instruments, and now today we use an app on a, an Apple phone. So you can always find where you're to pray, doesn't matter where you are in the world. You always know where Mecca is. The Qibla is sacrosanct and has been canonized since 624. So that means every mosque, every mosque should be facing Mecca, right? Because there were no mosques before 624. Remember, Muhammad died in 632. They didn't move out of, <clears throat> of uh, Mecca and Medina until 638 when they started taking over Basra, Baghdad, Damascus, Jerusalem, and Kara. So there were no mosques prior to 624. Every mosque after 624 should be facing Mecca. Well, Dan Gibson wanted to ask that question. And so he therefore decided to look at the earliest mosques. We do know that Dr. Creswell and Dr. Fehervardi, back in 1905, when they went to Iraq and they, when they went to Egypt, they uncovered the two oldest mosques in Iraq that they could find, and they dug down to the original floor plans, the Wasit Mosque and the Kufa Mosque there in Iraq, <clears throat> and the Fushtat Mosque in Egypt. And when they dug down to the floor plans, they found that both the Wasit Mosque and the Kufa Mosque were facing Petra. And that the Fushtat Mosque in Egypt was facing Petra. But they should have been facing Becca. Now, they said this is a curiosity and left it at that. In 1905, they could say no more. <coughs> Dr. Gibson wanted to find out a little bit more. And so he decided to go back and relook at this map. And then he wanted to find out exactly where the Qiblas were on all the oldest mosques. And so he went and visited all the mosques, and then he took pictures from space 
because he wasn't interested in where the moss were facing today. He wanted to see where the, art, where the original floor plans for the moss are. And the only way you can do that is to look down and see where the original uh, enclosures are from archaic days. And look what he found. The great moss of Guangzhou in China, built in 630. The Qibla is facing Petra. It should be facing Mecca. This is post-624. The Humaima Mosque in southwestern Jordan. The Qibla is facing Petra. It should be facing the other direction, towards Mecca. The Great Mosque of Baalbek in Lebanon. Do you see where the Qibla is facing? Petra. It should be facing Mecca. In 705, look at the date, 705. Muhammad died in 632. We're talking about a good 60 to 70 years later. The great mosque of Sana in the capital of Yemen, it's facing Petra. It should be facing Mecca. In 709, the Al-Aqsa Mosque in Jerusalem. And the Al-Aqsa Mosque is this one right down here. There's the Dome of the Rock right there. Look at the entire structure, the entire citadel of Jerusalem is facing Petra. It's not facing Mecca. And that's built in 709. Sorry, excuse me. Al-Aqsa Mosque is built in 709. The Dome of the Rock is built in 691. Both of them, the whole citadel, is facing Petra. The Damascus Mosque in Syria is facing Petra, 709 as well. The Anjar Mosque in Beirut, 714. It's also facing Petra. It should be facing Mecca. The Mosque of Umar in Basra, Syria. Look at the date, 720. It's facing Petra. It should be facing Mecca. It's not till 727, as far away as Banbor in Pakistan, that he gets the first mosque to face Mecca. 727, Muhammad died in 632. Almost 100 years later, before he finds the first mosque that is facing Mecca. Then in 728, in Syria, here the mosque is not facing Petra or Mecca. They don't know where they're to face. <laughs> and here's an interesting one. Here is the one in Amman in Jordan. Take a look at the lower mosque. The lower mosque is facing Petra. That was built in 700. Then it was rebuilt up here. Another mosque was rebuilt in 740. And this one now faces Mecca. The 700 mosque faces Petra. The 740 mosque up here faces Mecca. Finally, they get it right. But look at the date, 740. The Mushta mosque in Amman in 743. That's 743 and still it's facing Petra. It should be facing Mecca. And then in North Africa, it, does, it looks like they don't know where they're to face because almost all the mosques in North Africa, this one in Tunisia, is not facing Petra or Mecca. It's facing directly south. In Cordoba, Spain, again, 784. It doesn't know where to face. It's facing, again, neither Petra or Mecca. Here's another one in Tunisia, in Karaun, in 817. It's neither facing Petra or Mecca. It's facing somewhere south. So what is his conclusion? <clears throat> Every mosque up until 725 Every mosque in the first hundred years is facing Petra. And then for the next hundred years, between 725 and 822, 12% are facing Petra, 50% are facing Mecca, 38% are facing parallel. It takes them to 822 to finally get every mosque to face Mecca. Ooh, doo -doo -doo -doo. Takes them 200 years to finally get it right. Now, I've heard Muslims try to come back with us and say, well, they didn't know where directions were. Now, please, hold on a minute. <laughs> These were camel herders. They went through the deserts. There were no roads in the deserts. How did they find their way? How could they find these oases in the middle of these sand dunes? They used the stars. Certainly, they knew where Petra was, and they knew where Mecca was. And what's most curious, why is it that every mosque up until 725, all of them are facing Petra from as far away as China? That's what's curious, the fact that uniformly they're all facing Petra for about 100 years after Muhammad's death. If you take a look and see why, look where Petra is. Petra is at the center of the trades. It's at the center of the world at that time. I don't know how many of you have been to Petra. Have anybody here been to Petra? What have you noticed about Petra? It's a city of tombs and temples, isn't it? Beautiful, beautiful carvings out of the solid rock. And you go there and you will see that this is the center of the Nabataean, the Nabataean civilization. The Nabataeans were the precursors to the Arabs. Arabic comes from Nabataean, script. Almost all the traditions that we see in Arabia 
come from Nabataeans. They were the precursors. They were the ones that introduced Arabia. They were the ones that gave it its language. And they were the ones that we can trace all the way back to the second century BC. We can trace that this was the center of the world. This was a center of worship. This is where all the temples were facing. And that's why all these mosques were still following the same direction that all the temples have been following. But take a look at Petra a little closer. Petra is in a valley. It also has a parallel valley. There's a stream going right through Petra. It has fields, trees, grasses. It has clay. It has loam. It has olive trees. It is near the pillar of salt. In fact, it's Petra in a valley has all of the items listed in both the Quran and the traditions. Thus, it looks like it's Petra that, that is a place the Quran and the traditions are referring to. Why is that significant? Remember, we don't know nothing about Muhammad until the late 7th century. We know no reference to him until the 690s. His biography is not even written until the 9th century. His city of Mecca isn't referred to until the 8th century. Thus, much of what we know of Muhammad is written down hundreds of years later and hundreds of miles away. It looks like he is nothing more than a later redaction, possibly by Abdul al-Malik. Hold that under your hat, because now we get to the real juicy material. This is the one that I just found out about a few months ago. And I did a debate on this on June 22nd. <clears throat> and this has to do with the Quran, this book. See, if you can push Muhammad back quite a few years. But what are you going to do with this book? Because this is the foundation of Islam. That's why we have confronted this book. And I've been doing so for now 30 years. What are we going to do with this book? Because this book is what every Muslim has to dear to. This is the book that has always been. This is the book that is uncreated. This is the book, according to Surah 85, Ayah 22, that comes from those eternal tablets that have always coexisted with God. Therefore, it's co-eternal with God. This book cannot be critiqued. This book cannot be criticized. This book has no history. It is revealed to a man named Muhammad over a period of 610 to 622, 632, 22 years according to every Muslim. Whether they are radical, nominal, or liberal, every Muslim believes that this book is the uncreated Quran. Can you see what they're saying? The Quran is the greatest wonder among the wonders of the world. This book is second to none in the world according to the magnanimous decision of the learned men in points of diction, style, rhetoric, thoughts, and soundness of law, and regulations to shape the destinies of mankind. That's in the hadith, the Mishkat al-Masabi, which is a compilation of the six most authoritative hadith. <coughs> Muslims will say, Muhammad hath forged it. Answer, bring therefore a chapter like unto it. And call whom you be to your assistant besides Allah if ye speak. This is the greatest of all revelations, they tell me. I've had many debates. I remember doing a debate with Sheikh Omar Bakri Muhammad there in Trafalgar Square, right there on, on, on Nelson's column, in front of 5,000 Muslims who were there to have a rally for Islam in an August afternoon. There, back in the 1990s, I got up. He asked me to come up onto the plinth with him. Sheikh Omar Bakri Muhammad is probably the most radical cleric there is. And we had a debate, a prompted debate, for about 45 minutes in front of all these thousands of Muslims on the Quran itself. And after about 45 minutes, he finally turned to me and he mentioned, and he said, well, listen, if you don't like the Quran that much, then bring, therefore, a chapter like it. Show me anything that can equal this book. And I took out my Bible, and I opened up to Psalm 23. And I just started reading Psalm 23. And I started reading it. They turned off the microphone. So I spoke up. I went to the edge of the plinth, and I used my speaker's corner voice, which is pretty loud. And I finished Psalm 23. I turned towards the sheikh. I said, you show me a chapter like that. Show me any chapter that can equal Psalm 23. And I could have gone to Psalm 1 or Psalm 2 or any of the Psalms. I could have gone to 1 Corinthians 13. I could have gone to Matthew 5, Matthew 6, any of my favorite chapters. And you will find that many chapters, many verses are superior to the Quran. Yep. So when it happens to you, you say the same thing. <laughs> Yet for today, what we need to ask is, this is what the Muslims claim. It is the greatest of all revelation. It has never been created. That means every word, every letter that's in this book, in the Arabic, is the same that's there in heaven on the tablets. It has no history. It has no human intervention. It was sent down word for word by Jibril to a man named Muhammad who could not read or write. That's curious. <laughs> and finally written down 18 years after Muhammad dead, was dead. That's even more curious. Nonetheless, every Muslim will say that they can trace this book, unlike the Bible, they can trace this book all the way back to its origins. They can trace it all the way back to what they call the Uthmanic Recension. This is the Uthmanic Recension. This is the same book that was compiled by Uthman, that he had those four men 
Zubair, Alas, Harith, and Zaid ibn Tabit. The four men write that Quran. That's what they say. It's not me saying it. This is what the Muslims say. When was it written down? According to Al-Buhari, and this is what Al-Buhari has written. You can see it on the right there. This is the translation on the left. That Uthman in 650 did not have the entire corrected Quran text at hand, as Al-Buhari admits. A large part of the Quran may be lost. For he then orders three to help Zaid ibn Tabid, Zubair, Alas, and Harith, to revise the codex, which was given to Hafsa, the daughter of Umar, and correct it where necessary, even recalling a verse, chapter 33, verse 23, which had been missing from the original text. Isn't that curious? Uthman then takes Hafsa's Quranic manuscript and has the four compilers rewrite the text. And in case they disagreed, they were to write it in the dialect of the Quraysh and ordered that all the other Quranic materials, whether written in fragmentary manuscripts or whole copies, be burnt. Why would you burn manuscripts? Unless they disagreed. He then sent every Muslim province one copy of what had been copied. And that's what Muslims have told me for 30 years. And that's what you've heard, that four copies were then made of the original Quran. One was left in Medina, one was sent to Basra, one was sent to Baghdad, and one was sent to Damascus. Have you heard this? Every Muslim will tell you this. And if there are any Muslims here in the, in the room tonight, you will agree that there have been four original copies. Where are those copies? That's what we're asking tonight. Where are those copies? And I've asked this for 30 years, and in every debate I've asked, where are those copies? Now, Muslims always tell me that two of the copies still exist today. One is called the Topkapi Manuscript, which is in the Topkapi Palace, there in the Topkapi Museum in Istanbul, in Turkey. And the other is called the Samarkand Manuscript, which is in Tashkent, in Uzbekistan. This is the Topkapi Manuscript, and there's a picture of it. The Topkapi Manuscript, if you look up on the screen, you will notice, if you look carefully, you can see some blood stain right there. See some blood stain on it right there? That, according to Islamic tradition, is the blood stain of Uthman. He was reading it, and while he was reading, he was killed, and that's his blood on the copy. So this is an original Uthmanic recension. This is what every Muslim tells me, and if there's any Muslims here tonight, please tell me I'm wrong, because this is what every Muslim has told me. This is the original copy in Turkey, in Istanbul. And there's been no reason for me to disagree, because I've never been able to look at it. None of us have been able to do any study on it. We can't do any forensic testing. I'd love to do some accelerated mass spectrography. I'd love to be able to do some carbon testing on it, dating it to make sure that this is from the 7th century. We're not able to touch it. No one can touch it. This is the other one, the second one, the Samarkand. There's a picture of it up on the wall. The Samarkand is in Tashkent. That, according to Muslims, is the second manuscript. These are what are known as the Uthmanic recensions. Now, since no one has been able to look at it, of course, there's been a problem. We've just had to take them at their word. That wasn't until 2002. In 2002, two men in Turkey were then given access to this manuscript and also to the Tashkent manuscript. These two men are known as Dr. Ekmeledin Isanoglu and Dr. Tayar Altikulic. The reason they were given access to it is because they own, they are the ones that actually controlled those manuscripts. They live in Turkey. Dr. Tayal Altikulic is the world scholar, leading scholar in Quranic studies, ex-president of Turkish religious affairs, deputy in the Turkish parliament. He was given access to it in 2002, and for five years, he was able then to look at it from 2002 until 2007. I was only given his response. I was only given their, their, their response in May of this year, and here it is right here. This is 83 pages long. Actually, it's a thousand page book that they finally wrote. I only found out about this in May of this year. And let's hear what they are now saying. Now remember, these are the only scholars who have been given access to any of these manuscripts. And it's not just these two. I'll go about four other manuscripts as well. According to Dr. Ertan uh, Insanaglu, he says that the Topkapi manuscript is not Uthmanic at all. Nor do we have any of the copies of these Musafs. These Musafs, that's the manuscripts, date from the later Umayyad period. Dr. Tayar Al-Dakulic goes on, he says, there's no serious scholarly work has been done on them. These Musafs date from the early, mid-8th century. They are not Uthmanic, 
nor copies sent by him. The top copy manuscript, in, in fact, he says, has 2,270 manuscript variants. That means continental differences between that manuscript and the text that we have today. 2,270. The Toscat manuscript. He said when he looked at it, he realized that there were some problems here. It was obvious that whoever wrote that manuscript did not know Arabic very well. It has undisciplined spelling, different writing styles, scribal mistakes, copyist mistakes, written by someone with little experience, with later editions, and it only goes up to Surah 43. There's 114 surahs in the Quran. It's not even complete. Then he was given access to the Husseini manuscript, which is another one of these supposed Uthmanic recensions. Dr. Tayyad Altakulik said, this is not Uthmanic. It is dated from the early mid-century. The Paris Petropotalanist manuscript, which is in France, in Paris, uh, done by Dr. Francois de Roche, says that there are five different copies. Corrections were made to the text. When comparing with the Cairo edition, which is the, Cairo, which is the, the, uh, uh, the this canonized text, there are many words turn out to be written in a different way. Many questions still remain unanswered. What was more, he said, that it disagrees with the canonical readings in 93 places. Why haven't we been told this before? When they looked at the Ma'il Quran, which is in London, which is where I live, the Ma'il Quran, considered to be the second oldest Quran, dated to the late 8th century. It is not 7th century. It is not even complete. It only goes up to Surah 43. And then when they looked at the Sana manuscript, probably the most damaging, the Sana manuscript, which was discovered in 1975 in Yemen, the Germans were permitted to look at it in 1981. Dr. Gerd Pwin and Dr. Karl Heinz Ullig then looked in 1981, and they found that there were many deviations mentioned in later scripts. Just take a look at this picture here. This is from their uh, copies of it. Here you have Surah 19. That's written in Hijazi text. That's the script that would have been around in the 7th and 8th century. From 19, right at that yellow mark, it jumps to Surah 22. What happened to Surah 20 and 21? Surah 21 begins over on the next page in a completely different script, in a much later script. There's about 60 years between these two pages. So why haven't we been told this? Yet this script here is dated to 705, over here to the late 8th century. Take a look at every one of those orange marks. Every one of those orange marks are what we know as manuscript variants. That means words or phrases in that script that's different than the canonized text we have today. There's over a thousand of these manuscript variants. Yet Muslims tell us that the Quran has never changed. The Quran has always remained the same that this is God's holy text, that it is complete, and that it was complete by the time of Uthman. There's another picture of another page. When they looked at the palimpsest, now when they noticed that all of these manuscripts are written on skins, animal skins, we know them as parchment or vellum, and when they would write on the animal skins, they would wash it off and then write over top. And if you look carefully, you can see there's some writing underneath. See the writing underneath there? See the writing underneath there? They notice this writing underneath, so they put it under an ultraviolet light, and by putting it under ultraviolet light, they can split the texts and bring them aside and look at the two texts. And the lower script is known as defective script, the upper script is known as the final script. When they looked at the defective script of the Sana manuscript, they noticed that that was from the time of Abd al-Malik, basically the last two decades of the seventh century. The upper script was the time just after Abd al-Malik, probably Marwan, or his son, Ibn Marak. Ibn Malik, and take a look and look at the script and you will see that it does not agree with the Quran we have today. So what is that telling us? What was exciting is that <clears throat> on the back of every one of these folios, I have pictures of every one of these manuscripts, but on the back I have quoted what the Muslims are now telling us. What you read on the back of this, I can give this out to people if they want to come up and read it afterwards, are what the Muslims are now admitting. They are now admitting that none of the Musafs, none of the manuscripts are from the 7th century. That every one of the manuscripts is from the 8th century. Which means that the first manuscripts that even appear, that even come into existence, don't come into existence until 60 to 70 years after Muhammad. There is no manuscript that's earlier than that. Ooh, I love this. Makes my job a lot easier. Can you see why this is so damaging? Because if the first manuscripts that we see here, all these manuscripts, the Husseini manuscript, the Met uh, Paris Petropolitanist manuscript, the Ma'il Quran from London, 
the Sana manuscript from Sana in Yemen, if all of these manuscripts do not appear to the 8th century, then you can see, of course, what this is going to do to Muhammad. This means Muhammad had nothing to do with the Quran. And in one fell swoop, we have destroyed the Quran and Muhammad simultaneously. And what happens to Islam? Now, I introduced this in June 22nd, the first time I'd heard about this, because I had always assumed that these Qurans began with Uthman. It wasn't until May of this year that I found out different. I went to this debate, and I introduced it at the debate. The debater, Adnan Rashid, who's considered probably one of the best debaters in Britain today, had no response. He held up a coin. He says, Mr. Smith, if you don't believe that the Quran existed in the 7th century, take a look at this coin. There you can see the name of Muhammad written on it. There you can see the Shahada. I said, exactly. Do you know who made that coin? His name is Abdul Malik. You just made my point. He introduces that coin in 691. I've just got done saying that. It is he that introduces Muhammad as a prophet on that coin and also on the Dome of the Rock. It's Abdul Malik who is the one that creates and begins the first Quran. It's Abdul Malik that one, the one that names who the prophet's going to be. It's Abdul Malik who is one that introduces the name Muslim. It's Abdul Malik who introduces the name Islam. It all begins with Abdul Malik. You're going to hear this name more and more. And have you noticed that all the mosques are facing Petra until immediately after Abdul Malik and then they start to face Mecca? It all begins with Abdul Malik. So who is Abdul Malik? He was the caliph from 685 to 705. He is the one that is known as the great Arab reformer. He takes and creates an identity for Arabs. And what do you do when you try to create an identity for Arabs? Remember, they had already taken over Basra, Baghdad, Damascus, Jerusalem, and Cairo, these cities that are all over the Levant. They had now taken over all of North Africa, gone all the way to, to India in the east and Spain in the west. This they did by the end of the 7th century. But all their traditions were dependent on Judeo-Christian prophets. All their traditions come the line of Isaac. And they're not from that line. They needed a prophet who comes from Ishmael. So what do you do? You create a prophet. And you redact it back to the man who started the conquest. And we know that Muhammad is historical. He is the one that begins the conquest. He dies in 632. But if he's a prophet, he has to have a book. So you start amassing and borrowing from many different sources. And look at the Quran. It is full of borrowing. 70% of the Quran we can now trace back to Jewish apocryphal writings and Christian Sectarian writings. There's nothing new under the sun. They borrow right, left, and center. But when you start compiling it, there are going to be different Qurans. You can see there were different schools. There was one school in Damascus where a man named Abu Ubay ibn Qab had a manuscript that was different from Basra, where there was another Quran that was written by a man named Ibn Masud. I mean, Ibn Musa, which was different from another Quran that was in Baghdad named Ibn Masud, which is different from another Quran that was in Medina, written by a man Zaid ibn Thabit. You remember those names? These are all in their traditions. I'm referring to their own traditions. Dr. Arthur Jeffries in the 1930s looked at all these traditions and he just looked at what they said about the Quran. And when he looked at the Quran, he found out that there were 11 different Qurans mentioned in the traditions and there were 15,000 differences between these 11 Qurans. Ooh, doo -doo 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 -doo. Now, why haven't Muslims told us this? Can you see it makes my job a lot easier? But can you see what we're doing tonight? Everything I've said tonight is now agreed by Western scholars. Western scholars are now concluding that the earliest Quranic manuscripts begin to appear in the 8th century. Muslim scholars conclude that the earliest Musafs begin in the, er, appear in the 8th century. And now, finally, Islamic awareness. <clears throat> Islamic awareness is probably the biggest Muslim website that deals with manuscript evidence. They've been a pain in our side for the last 30 years. Go up on their website and look at their manuscript section. They are now quoting Dr. Tayyip Altukulic. They have to. They have no other choice. And they are for the first time finally admitting that there is no complete manuscript at all in the 7th century. Isn't this great? Yes. Isn't it great to be living at this time? Yes. Can you see that we have now used the same traditions? Remember, the same thing was said of our Bible back in the 1800s. Wellhausen, there in Tübingen, there in Germany start attacking our Bible, saying that much of the Bible is nothing more than redactions, many, many uh, oral traditions, folk tales, 
that were put together possibly in the 6th century B.C., redacted to a man named Moses in 1400 B.C., about a man named Abraham in 1900 B.C., but that we can't trust any of it. Remember when that came out? And there was a documentary hypothesis, and then there was the redacted criticism, there was source criticism, there was literary criticism, higher and lower criticism, and by 1905, this had moved down into the seminaries, had come down into the churches, and all across Europe, the churches were decimated. Destroyed the church by 1905. So that today in Europe, only 5% of people go to church. See what historical criticism has done to our Bible. But we were jacked up. We realized we've got to do our homework. Amen. And that's why we started looking around and finding artifact after artifact. And God bless the British. They went all over the world and they stole everything they could and put it into the British Museum so we could look at it. <laughs> and if you come to London, I will take you to the British Museum and you've got to see all the artifacts in the British Museum from the Assyrian period, the 9th and 8th and 7th century BC, from the Babylonian period, from the 7th and 6th century BC, up into the Persian period that supports 1st and 2nd Kings, 1st and 2nd Chronicles, 1st and 2nd Samuel. Come and see how it supports the book of Genesis, the book of Jeremiah, the book of Daniel. Oh, it's beautiful. All of it using the same criticisms, the same criticisms that we've asked of Islam. We can now support almost every, in fact, there has not been one piece of evidence that has now been found that controverts one properly understood biblical statement. That's how good our Bible is. We have passed the test. And if you want to look at the New Testament, just come and look at what we have now found. We have now found 12 either partial pieces of manuscripts from the second century. We have now found 68 manuscripts from the third century. We have found 46 from the fourth century. You add that up, that's 124 manuscripts that predate the Sinaiticus, the first complete 27 book manuscript there in the British Library. If you look at those 124 partial manuscripts, you can reproduce the, the New Testament many times over. And that's 300 years before the Quran even came into existence. We have a 230 manuscripts that predate the sixth century. That's 100 years before the Quran even came to existence. What did I say came into existence? Oh, excuse me, the 8th century. The first Quran only begins to appear in the 8th century. Ooh, I love my Bible. <laughs> and it makes my job an awful lot easier. See, we're asking the same questions of Islam that we've asked of our own Bible. We've passed that test. The Bible passed every test. Source criticism, redacted criticism, the documentary hypothesis, every one of them have been answered. And that's why I take my Bible everywhere I go. And I love it when they say it's been corrupted. I just ask two simple words, where and when? Where and when? And then I have the platform to just talk about my Bible for the next hour. And you can do the same. You can do the same. Islamic awareness has now agreed that all the Musafs, all the earliest manuscripts, that includes the Topkapi, that includes the Samarkand, that includes the, yes, the Sana manuscript, that includes the Ma'il manuscript, that also includes the Husseini manuscript, and also the Petropotalus, Paris manuscript. Every one of those earliest six manuscripts are all from the 8th century. None of them from the 7th century. So therefore, if the Western scholars agree, if the Muslim scholars agree, if Islamic awareness agrees, Therefore, I conclude that if the earliest Musafs begin to appear in the 8th century, then Muhammad had nothing to do with the Quran. That's my conclusion. Now, I was there on, in the mid-July, I was there on the ladder, and I looked down into the crowd of Muslims that were below me, and I noticed that one of the Muslims in the crowd was from Islamic Awareness. His name is Mansur Ahmad. He's one of the writers for the Islamic Awareness. He had his camera on me as I was showing these different pictures of these different Musafs, his Musafs. I turned to Mansur, and I said, everything I'm reading comes from your website. And I just read from his website, quote after quote after quote. I said to Mansur, you say that the Quran has never changed. You tell me that the Quran is perfect. You tell me that the Quran is, is complete, and that there has been no manuscript that has been destroyed, that all the manuscripts agree. Yet here, I'm just showing you from your own website that the top copy manuscript has 2,270 difference from the Quran we have today. That the Samarkand that you believe was perfect only goes up to Surah 43, was written by an amateur. You're the ones that are writing this on your website. I said, I therefore challenge you to find one complete manuscript from the time of Uthman. One complete manuscript from the 7th century. He closed up his camera and walked away. <laughs> he had no response. It makes my job an awful lot easier. 
Now, the historical assessment concerning Islam, that the first Arab inscriptions referencing Muhammad only begin in 691, the first reference to Muslims until 690s, the first Arab reference to Muslims is just prior to 749, the first reference to Islam is not till 691, I've already said this, and the first reference to Mecca, not till 741. Can you see what we're now dealing with? There's an awful lot of work yet to be done. We now are going to have to piece all the pictures together. We don't have a complete understanding of what this all says. But what we can now say pretty much categorically is that the Quran does not come from God. It probably began with Abdul Malik. And it certainly does not come from Muhammad. And if we don't know anything about Muhammad until the late 7th century, and we don't even have his biography until the 9th century, then should we trust any of it? Now, I want to be careful. If there are any Muslims in the audience... I'm not here to destroy Muslims. I'm here to destroy your Quran. I have nothing against Muslims. It's this book that bothers me. Because it's this book that does to you what I see going around the world. It's this book that damages women. It's this book that damages men. It's this book that damages my God. It's this book that damages Jesus Christ. That's why I can only confront this book. And it's your prophet that takes this book and supposedly gives it credibility. That's why we're doing what we're doing tonight. And I want to tell Muslims, listen, this book no longer is the word of God, but this book is. Amen. Please don't give up God. Come on home to this God. Please don't give up revelation. Come on home to this revelation. Please don't give up Issa. Come on home to Yeshua, the real Jesus. I love the passion of Muslims. I love the fact that they do love God. And they want to obey God. I just want to bring them home to the real God. I love the fact that they are willing to give their lives for their Quran. They don't need to anymore. Give their life to Jesus Christ. So I ask Muslims in the audience tonight and those who are watching, please, I'm not here to destroy you. I'm here to bring you home. Come on home.